this morning, the title of the message is Story Before Glory. Genesis 41, 39 to 46. Genesis 31 and 41, 39 to 36. That was the Bible reading. And it starts by saying, So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man whom is in whom is the spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land. And if you keep reading, you see everything. Then in 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh the king. If you read that chapter of the Bible and you go to Genesis 41 and you start from 39, that's the glory. Because the story of Joseph from there, if it was today, the headline would be simple. It's a top 30 under 30. Fortune magazine will bring him out. The youngest prime minister in the world. Everybody will celebrate him because that's what we like. And that's what we see. The story of Joseph is not in the time of his glory. The glory is what people see. But most people don't understand that there's a story behind it. Before you say you want someone's life or you want to be like somebody, ask about their story. The general overseer of this mission, many people say anything they want about him. Oh, he's this, he's that. Some people love him, some people loathe him. Some people covet what he has. Oh, I want to be like the general overseer. Oh, I want to be like him. But if you go and read his story, in his own autobiography, in the books that he wrote, and in the testimony of his mouth, he said that amongst poor people, his family was considered to be poor. That's the story. But today, at his age, people are seeing what they see, which is the glory. He said he did not wear shoes until he was probably 16. That they were so poor that it was difficult for him to go to school. It was just by grace. That is the story behind the glory. Tomorrow is the 8th of November. My father died at the age of 43 years old. November 8, 1971. So tomorrow will be 50 years that my father died. And I'm only 52, so you can do the math. When he died, I was one year, 11 months. So if you see anything in my life that you like, glory be to God. But do you know the story that is behind what you see today? Don't envy anybody because whatever situation you are, God will see you through in the mighty name of Jesus. Be focused on your own story and build on it to get your own glory. Don't be envious of anybody because their station in life, life is a life of seasons. There is a season when you may be mourning. There is a season when you may be a child. There is a season when you are an adult. There is a season of responsibility. There is a season when you are dependent. The problem in life is many people are so focused on reading. This is why social media is dangerous. If you go, I can put this in my house, in one little corner, and start filming that you will think I'm in a, I'm in an, a great big auditorium and you are envious of me. I can go and cut and paste Gucci, Fendi, Ferragamo, um, sit in front of a Bugatti, and people, are, and people will almost go mad. They say, can you imagine, you see, eh, other people's husband have done it. What about you? What? And the person has nothing. It may be rental. You must be more interested in this story instead of the glory. I've given you many examples. The one that always makes me laugh, and I've said it often, and I'm sure you say, oh, pastor, here we go again. You say both. I find him really amazing. I like him as a person. And he runs. And I think he went under nine seconds. And somebody went to him and said, wow. And they calculated, let's say they gave him $9 million. They said that was $1 million a second. 
He, he just laughed. He laughed because let's say he was 29 at that time. That's 29 years, 9 seconds. It's not 9 seconds. Every day of training, every day of waking up, every day of not eating McDonald's, every day of going to the gym, every day of everything he did is what ended up in the glory of 9 seconds. But the world applauds the 9 seconds. Somebody gets a first class in university, you say he's lucky. If he was lucky, there would be no first class because everybody would get first class. There's something that that person deprived themselves of. There's something that that person disciplined themselves to do. And over the years, it accumulated. That's why people like us didn't get first class. Because we did not do. It's not there's no capacity. The capacity is there. But we chose not to. We said, well, we still want to enjoy life. That's why many of you are not born again. You are religious. But this morning, Sunday school, they talked about courage. Self-denial is courage. To see that you can sleep with somebody else's wife and refuse to do it is courageous. To decide not to take drugs, although all your friends are saying, let's take it, that's courage. To decide to follow Jesus when the person next to you is holding you, don't, 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 if you stand up, you say, leave me alone. For people to ridicule you that where is your God? I thought you are born again. How come you are not married? I thought you are born again. How come you don't have children? I thought you are born again. Why are you short? Why are you tall? Everybody has something to talk about. The issue of your life is that you must ensure that your story becomes glory. Envy no man. Have confidence in God. The story of Joseph is so interesting to me and we know it all. When we go to Genesis chapter 41, where Joseph's life changes, it just changes and everything begins to go up. Like they say now, it popped. <laughs> his life just took off. But his real story started in Genesis 37. I'm not going to bore you by reading every chapter. But he was born and he was actually blessed. Because the Bible says in Genesis 37 that his father loved him more than everybody else. So he started good, right? He started putting him in charge of even his older brothers. He was the supervisor. And so when your story is good, you begin to relax. I was reading something that they said one of the emirs or guys that are from Dubai or one of those Qatar or one of those countries, don't quote me, one of them, alleged quotes, because when you see it on the internet itself, you don't know whether it's true. But the quote was right. He said his father started with a camel. His grandfather, started, rode, his grandfather rode a camel. His father rode a camel. He's now riding, let's say, a Rolls Royce. And he said his own son too will ride a Rolls Royce. He said, but his grandchild is going to go back to camel. And they say, why? He said, ah. he said it is the hardship that his grandfather went through and that his father went through that caused him to come up to the Rolls Royce. Let's say he said Rolls Royce. He said, but because he already has the Rolls Royce, his son has no choice. His son will just inherit it. Now, when inheritance comes, relaxation will come because there's no need to hustle. And when there's no need to hustle, you are going to lose it all. Hardship is good. I told you once that there was a man that came to my school. His name was Taisho Larry. Those that are Nigerians know him. He was an avowed atheist. That part I don't like. But this atheist, and you can quote me, had more God in him than many bishops. He loved humanity, but for whatever reason, he just figured out in his mind there's no God. And he came to our school. I was maybe 11 years old. I never forget. And his speech was, may your road be rough. And of course, as Nigerians, God forbid, God forbid. You know, this is, I don't know what that has to do with anybody, but that's how we do it. I reject it. What are you rejecting? And he went on, as young children, to explain to us that if our road is easy, we won't make it. Easy road is slippery. That's why when you go to the gym, to build muscle is resistance. If you are just doing this, there's nothing that's going to happen. But if you do this, 
You do the other one, oh, you know you are going somewhere. But they say no pain, no gain. That's why I'm like this. <laughs> There's no, I'm not doing any pain. I'm, whether they gain or they don't gain, God will help us <laughs> with the rest. In that area, I concede. Amen? Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? So, hardship is not failure. I've said it often that what we call failure is the foundation on which success is built. You need some hardship. And this is a challenge for our children. There's no story. I've told you this story before also. When we were young, you will be praying that they should buy you a bicycle. When they give us food, and on Easter is chicken and rice, or you are even you are you are even smelling it, just the smell. We you just had to dance. You just you will be so you will be, but today you can present twenty different foods for your own children now, and mine. They be like, what? They want pizza. You give them pizza, they don't want pepperoni. You give them. <laughs> When I was young, how many people ha had conflicts when they were young? Did you figure out which type? Do you have different uh, Even when they started doing the Made in Nigeria one that's hard like, like rock, you still celebrate. Today, you go and take canned milk, the one you, you know, you know our canned milk now, and pour it for your children. They won't drink it. They say, you, it tastes funny. Pancake, it tastes funny. <laughs> because... Their life is easy. And this is why there are challenges. You want glory? Don't over pamper yourself and don't over pamper your children. Anything that is successful is hard. For you to have success, you must embrace hardship. You must not love hardship but you must embrace it as part of the way that you have to go to come out. For gold to become what women wear as, and men, some men are wearing it too, as jewelry, it passes through fire. Do you know what that fire does? It burns off the impurities, the ones that are not real gold. And that's why most people are not successful. Because most people can't go through the fire. There is almost no billionaire or millionaire or successful people that has almost not gone bankrupt. Go and read their history. There is no successful business person that their business has not failed. Who is your teacher if not adversity? And Christians have turned church to a um, magic center. You don't read, you want to pass. Looking for miracle pen. You don't do what you are supposed to do. You want the result because they said Elijah called. Yes. Elijah wasn't doing what you were doing. And you are no Elijah. You are not doing what the people that you are trying to compare yourself to, you are not doing what they are doing. So you can't get the same result. I know you will laugh now if I say, you don't go near your wife and you say she's not pregnant. I pray. Amen? If there's a challenge that you have, you have to confront the challenge. Put your head up. Put your shoulders back. Brush off after you fall. Get up. Cry a little bit. It's good to cry. Say, ah, me. Or Monili Olono. You feel sorry for it. When you are finished with your feeling sorry, wipe your face and get on with it. Nobody's going to do it for you. Everything you need to succeed is inside you. The only pathway is that God has outlined some things. Look at the story of Joseph. Born with a silver spoon. Favored by his father. Given a coat of many colors. Prattling around like the king. Having dreams. God is even speaking to him. Can you imagine? He was so blessed. If he continued with that lifestyle, that's why he was reporting his brothers everywhere. He'd go and be man, doing, you know, he just because he had confidence. That's what motivational speakers will teach you. Look in the mirror. Say, I am great. I am, okay, good. After you finish it, you still need character. You need integrity. You need hard work. 
And if Dave, Joseph was taught by a, a um, motivational speaker, he would have given up. His own confidence was in God. His integrity was based on God. And when the first test came and they threw him in the pit, he knew he wasn't supposed to be in the pit. He was telling him, okay, sorry, just <laughs> let me out. I won't tell daddy. And they said, yeah, you are joking. You don't even know what we're going to do with you. We want to kill you. And God sent somebody to intervene. The Bible says he will always make a way of escape. He did not curse God. He did not say there's no God. When they sold him and he got to Potiphar's house, because there was a spirit of excellence upon him. Listen to me. Whether you are cleaning, whether you are working in McDonald's, whether you are working as a janitor, whether if you are a child of God, even the way you carry yourself as you are mopping the floor, they will know. You mop it with dignity and you mop it well. It is in your mopping well that somebody may give you a scholarship or an opportunity. But if you are mopping, sloppy, getting angry that why am I here? Why did my father die? Why did my mother die? Why did he, if it's not what happened, is Buhari that ruined the country? If not for all those thieves in Nigeria, yes, they are thieves. What are you going to do? You still have to get up and you still have to do what you have to do. You are responsible for your own life. So David went as a slave and guess what? And Joseph went as a slave. Guess what happened? He became the head of the slaves or the servants. At your job that is below your qualification, are you the best? I know many people that keep telling me, Pastor, I have masters, I have PhD, I have this, and the, what I'm doing is beneath me. Yes. But do it in such a way that people will know that hmm, there's somebody that's doing it. The Bible says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. The integrity of your heart will take you wherever. The Bible says, see a man diligent in his business. What is diligence? Diligence is being disciplined. Not the discipline of supervisor. There is a discipline that's called self-discipline. That's the real discipline. Where there's nobody watching you. Nobody telling you. But by yourself, they sent you to college. And all your friends are smoking weed. And you discipline yourself, I'm not going to take weed. You are in college. All your friends are popping pills. You decide in yourself that I'm a king, I'm a queen. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I will not do it. Not that you look around. Mommy is not here. Daddy is not here. You pop it. This is what takes people, the Bible says, see a man diligent in his business. A lot of people are diligent in every other person's business except their business. They know what to teach everybody. Ah, pastor, you shouldn't say it like that. You should say it like this. Ah, Mr. Michael, you shouldn't wear it like this. You should wear it like this. And you look at them. They are like the tailor that sews three-piece suit and wear a rag like the pastor taught us in the camp. They are like the conductor who is saying, Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. And he has never been to Washington, D.C. He has only been calling people to go to Washington, D.C. He can tell them where to go. There's the MLK Memorial in Washington, D.C. There's the White House. There's the Smithsonian. There, he knows everything in Washington, D.C., but he himself has never been there. May you not be a conductor. <laughs> May you not be a spectator in the affairs of your own life complaining, groaning, mumbling, it will not take anybody anywhere. So what did Joseph do? Joseph decided to be the best servant that he could be. The people he met there, he became their foreman. The people he met there, he became their supervisor. Satan said, ah, this boy, I planned to kill him. His brother intervened and said, let's sell him. I made him a slave. Instead of him to give up on his integrity and decide to join them and be stealing from his master to be building his own house, steal from his master, to be doing this, Satan said, I know what I will do. <laughs> I know man. Man is flesh and man is weak. I'm going to set a trap for him. I'm going to use somebody that he can't resist. And when that somebody came in the, in, as Potiphar's wife, what did he do? His father wasn't there. God did not come down. He disciplined himself. I will not sin against my master. 
and I will not sin against God. The only way you can stop adultery, all of you watching me that are still in adultery, is when you decide that the sin of adultery is against God. It's not against your spouse. Yes, your spouse is wicked. They did this. They, mm -mm. It can't help you. You are the one that must decide who you are and to whom you belong. Joseph decided that he belonged to God. He was not in church. There was no church in Egypt. There was no synagogue in Egypt. But he did not, he perfected who he was because you must have core principles if you are a child of God. Those core principles must say these things are a no-no. No excuse. Most Christians say it's not my fault, pastor. It's because of so, so, so. There's no because. Let me tell you what happened. You know, when we were young in Nigeria, they had these courts that they used to do a film call and they say, uh, guilty or not guilty? They say, I'm, I'm not guilty with explanation. Or I'm guilty with... There's no explanation. God does not ask anybody what happened. It is you against you. So Joseph said, no. I won't do it. I don't want it. The Bible says, flee from every appearance of evil. As the woman was trying to capture him, he didn't wait and say, mommy, please, don't do this. You know that or God will, if a guy catches us, you want to do. That's why you are giving explanation. He fled away. If you don't know the story, sorry, we can't go deep. He just fled. He fled so fast that he left his jacket. Even when she was holding the jacket, he didn't run back and say, mommy, please now, give me the jacket. Some of us, we are tempting sin. We go, we come, we go. Somebody calls you. You know that the way that person is making you feel is not right. And you continue to be calling each other. He said, you know I'm a married man. Uh, you know that you yourself are a married man. And you know that the way it's making you feel is not going anywhere. Instead of inviting your wife into the conversation. So that it will just end quickly. Sin does not, the Bible tells us to be careful about a particular type of sin, the one that easily besets, the one that can just, you won't even know that you are doing it, but slowly you are there. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. So David, um, Joseph was punished again. I'm telling you this story. You know what we started is what with the glory. 30 under 30, prime minister. Pharaoh said to him, after me is you, nobody else in this land. He was riding in the second chariot and people were running in front of him. Here comes Joseph, prime minister of Egypt and the realms of Egypt. Here comes, they say anything he says is law. If you go and say, I want to be like Joseph, are you willing to go to the pit like Joseph? Are you willing to go to Potiphar's house like Joseph? Are you willing to go to prison? Because even after that, he went to prison and he did nothing wrong. I'm talking to somebody here this morning that the only reason why they are angry is that they did nothing wrong. Pastor, even if I did it, I will understand. I serve God. I tithe. I am the first person in church. I'm the one that helped you to carry your Bible up. I do this, I do that, I give to the poor, I live in the sick um, hospital, I, I help, you know, that's self-righteousness. Who knows why anything happens to anybody? Who knows? Who knows why you were born? But since we are alive, and there's a road map, why don't you take that road map? I've always wondered why people don't want Christ. Because apart from the political argument which some of my friends have that it was a white man that gave us Christ and the white man is wicked, which is a flawed argument because technically Christ is not white, you know, so it doesn't even make any sense. It was actually Romans that killed him. So if you want to call Romans white, that's a whole other argument. But you get what I'm saying. So, but, but let's move that away. So 
I'm wearing a suit today. Does that make me un African? If I like wearing suit, I like wearing suit. If you love pizza, does that make you Italian? You love pizza, it's good, it's nice. You like it. You like pasta, you don't like you like Kamala, it's good for you. Anybody can like anything. Africans are, are playing um, their own music. White people are playing rap now. They say they are stealing our culture and all that. You take whatever you want. So when you take from everything that is good, so if you're going to take something and you see something that you think is good, I, I just read the Bible. I was a skeptic. I didn't believe in, the, I was agnostic at a point. But I got to a stage, I started studying the Bible more, having an encounter, and I started saying, what is this Jesus even saying? And they asked, what is he saying? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. What is bad in that? What is bad in not hating people? What is bad in forgiving people? What is bad? The bottom line of Christianity is love. What is bad in being respectful to your spouse? What's bad in, in treating your spouse as you want to be treated? What's bad in treating others? as you want to be treated. What's bad in not lying? Because the Bible simply says that, you know, the devil is a liar and the father of lies that we shouldn't lie. So, the, the basis of Christianity is not in the fallen pastors that you used to say that's why you don't, oh, all these pastors are thieves. Then who is following the pastor in the first place? Are you following what I'm saying? Oh, some priests were raping little boys. Well, did, did, did Jesus say we should rape little boys? No. When somebody perverts something, even in this country where we have laws, they say when you get to a stop sign, you should stop. When you don't stop, does it mean the stop sign is not right? It's not the stop sign that you blame, it's the offender. It's not, the, 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 the rules are there. So if you are a pastor and you are doing something that you ought not to do, does it mean the Bible is wrong? Did it, no, it is if the word of God is saying you should do those things. Everything about Jesus was that Jesus Christ of Nazareth went about doing good. And everything he wrote in his book that I believe, some people say, well, I can do those things without following Christ. That's fine. But we are spirits. And ultimately, every culture has been looking for a way for that spirit to connect with a spirit. We decided and we read and we believe that the spirit of the living God is the real spirit of God. And if you follow the word of God, then it will be easy for you. Joseph had integrity because he feared God. He lived by certain rules and those rules shaped his story. What am I saying this morning? Forget about glory. It's like when I do business seminars, I, anybody that comes to me about business, when they start talking within 15 minutes, I know whether they will most likely make it or not. Why? Because if all you are interested in is the return on investment, that person will not go far. You must be interested in bringing value. It is the value that Microsoft brought. When Bill Gates started, he did not make money. It was, I read his book 20 years. I didn't even read it now. Long time ago. I have to go and reread it. He used to sneak out of his house in the middle of the night. That's the story. Hold on. Bill Gates, the richest man in the world. Or was the richest man in the world. He would sneak out of his house at night. And in his school, they had one computer. He said the computer was as big as one room. But he was so interested in it that he will secretly leave the door ajar at night, the school door. He will put something by the school door and he will sneak when people, like 2 a.m. and he will be on that computer, the one big giant computer in the whole town probably. And at about 5 a.m. he will now run back home and wake up again to go to school. Then you want to be like Bill Gates. Can you do what he's doing? Did you, uh, if you don't apply yourself, if you don't lend your ear to hear from God, how will you hear from him? And so Joseph's story ended up again in jail. But when he got to jail, what did he do? Did he start to blame God and get upset? No. The Bible says he became the head. 
of the prisoners. Again, look, quality is quality. When I go and study, I read about slavery in America, and you will discover, you see, so many things have been bastardized. There were people who they were captured as slaves, African Americans, but where they were coming from, they were like kings or princes. They knew who they were. So even when they came in their chains, they walked different. They, they cleaned, they beat them, they tortured them, but everybody respected them. Respect is not office. It's not your office. It's your value. They, that's why you, if you meet somebody, even you is, is in a lowly position, but you will know you will just identify there's something about this person. That's why you are a threat to many people. Don't give in because you are not where you want to be. Believe that you are in your training ground. When you are a businessman and you lose money, that is your MBA. Some people went to a school and paid money to do MBA in Harvard. You, because you didn't have money or you didn't have the grades to get into Harvard, you have to lose the same amount of money that other people used to go to Harvard. <laughs> because if they went and bought it, you will now have to acquire it. But if you give up because you lost money, if you give up because people are talking about you, if you give up because you are not yet married, if you give up because you don't have children, if you give up because you are not tall, if you give up because you are too tall, then who's, it's your business. You will end up suffering all by yourself. God has deposited in the blind man greatness. And we saw that in Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder. Even in their blindness, they were great. Because there's value. God has deposited something in you. And that thing is your story. And that thing is tough. Let me run through a few people. And so we know that by the time we get to Genesis chapter 41, from verse 39, when Pharaoh now said, you, Joseph. And you know the one I like, what I love most about Joseph is, you must be prepared. I, honestly, and I'm not bragging, it's not like I'm really rich financially, but I'm rich by the grace of God. What I'm trying to say is that I've never thought of myself poor, even when I had no money. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? I've never thought of myself as a victim, even though I have an accent. I've never thought of myself too black that I have to bleach it to come to another color. No. I've always liked the way I am. When I was fat, glory be to God. When I'm chubby, it's okay. Let me, let me keep doing what we're... You keep going on. When they say your name is too long, some of you change your name. Olure me, let me you change it to Lolo or Jibu, Jubi, Jibi. You want to Jimmy? No. That's your unique quality. Go and read the autobiography of Barack Obama. He used to call himself Barry because he just wanted to fit in. Let your children know that their name is their identity. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You are not Barry. And when he came to his senses, he changed the name to Barack back, which was his real name. Instead of making that name a burden, he turned that name to an advantage. There's no way that Barack Obama went that nobody remembered him because they didn't know any other Barack. Just like me. Nobody, that, nobody knows any Olure, me or Shikoli. It's me. You know, in my language, yeah, me you Jasha. You know, it's me. Yes, I like it. I don't want to be Remo or Ira, Ira. No. I'm Remy. And I'm not Remy. I'm Remy. My wife laughs at me when I call on the phone. They say, we speak Olure, me or Shikonlu. No, it's not Oshikonlu. No, it's Oshikonlu. You can pronounce it, but I can pronounce it. So why should I now mispronounce my name to make you comfortable? I, all I have to do is spell it for you. Because you are not going to change your, your name to Peteru. You say, Hello, this is Mr. Peteru. No, you're going to say, this is Peter. Yeah, that's you. You, Peter. For me, it's Peter. We try. So, you are, we, that's how we know each other. Do you get what I'm saying? So, no, be, be, be happy about you. Be happy if God gave you slim. You know, like Mr. Tuna now, I'm looking at him slim. He can never be fat. Don't be jealous of him. Just let him thank God for him. 
you, you get what I'm saying? Be happy with you and ask God that what did you deposit in me? Decide to walk with God. Decide to do the things of God. Decide to honor God. Decide to be respectful of God. Listen to this. The beauty of the Bible. I'm going to, I'm going to, to sort of go through it quickly. You see, I was looking at Abraham. The backstory of Abraham is in the Bible. There's no book like that. Most people only tell you of their successes. You go and read all these books. They tell you how they did well. But Abraham's story that he went to Egypt instead of going to Canaan is in the Bible. Abraham's story that he lied about his, his wife being his sister is in the Bible. Abraham's story that he grabbed Hagar and said, oh, my wife is the one that gave me mm, glory be to God is in the Bible. Am I lying? Can they force you? They can't force anybody. Anyway, Abraham's backstory is what made Abraham the father of faith. Amen? So when you are feeling sorry for yourself, what about David's backstory? David's backstory is in the Bible. One particular one is his nonsense with Bathsheba. God did not present David as a great man. And this is the problem with born-again Christians. Born-again Christians keep putting a standard that God did not put on anybody, on people. Holier than thou. You are so holy and you are the greatest sinner. It's just that we haven't known your own yet. So just leave other people's sin and work on your own. But don't give up. If David had died because he did Bathsheba's problem, he would not be the David of today. He went back to God. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew the right spirit within me. We know the backstory of Samson. I want that girl. Get her for me. That's what ended him up with Jez, um, Delilah. And we know his backstory. That's how they took out his eyes. But in the end, he made little mistake in his prayer by saying, let me die with the Philistines. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Don't give up on yourself. Everybody will give up on you. Probably you're only your mother and a good wife or a good husband. Because when your wala is too much, they will leave you. Do you know how many people, all these people that are on the street, homeless, you think they don't have brothers and sisters? The brother will say, I've tried. I've tried to stop drugs. I've tried to get him up. I put him in a shelter. I did this. I did that. You know something? Don't kill me. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible tells us the story of um, Peter. The backstory of Peter is what? He denied Christ. Did that cost him making it? I mean, while if you catch one person, that person will never make it again. Because you are now God, you caught them. There's a story to everything. The backstory of Paul is that his name was Saul. And he was consenting to the death of Stephen and then many other Christians that he persecuted. The backstory of Moses was that he was a murderer. Somebody was fighting. When I read the Bible at times, you know, I'm like, I'm thinking, what's your business? Moses, two people were fighting. He said, don't kill your other brother. Okay. Do you want to kill me? No, what's your... He went to kill the person. That anger. But Moses still made it. Don't get into a cycle of depression because some people have told you you can't make it. You will make it in the mighty name of Jesus. The backstory of Thomas was that he kept doubting. His faith was shaking. But did he stop? No. He, con he continued with God. The backstory of Rahab was that she was a harlot. And yet she's in the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. The backstory of Israel is that his name was Jacob. Stop reading the headlines. Go and look at the story. What is your backstory today? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, as I close, let's rise. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you are here this morning and you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your life. If somebody has told you that you can't do it, don't mind them. 
They don't know the word of God. The Bible says, unless you are born again, what does it mean to be born again? Your old story, you lock it up and you say, no more. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not smoking anymore. I'm not wicked anymore. I'm not doing revenge anymore. I'm not stealing anymore. I'm not lying anymore. He says, when you are in Christ, you have become a new creature. He says that all things, all the things that you used to do, so new course said, sang, sang, says, all the bad, 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 bad things I used to do, I do them no more. All the bad, bad, bad places I used to go, I go there no more. And he said, it was a great day since I met Christ. And so this is what the word is saying. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Everything you have done has passed away. That's why I mentioned all those people. It says everything has become new. If you have never given your life to Christ and you want to do it today, on the day Mrs. Lydia in day is celebrating her birthday, on the day Nancy is coming to give glory to God for her life, if you want to give your life to Christ, come to the altar of God now. Don't look at anybody. Don't let anybody tell you anything. Make up your mind. Don't be ashamed of God and God will not be ashamed of you. You stand up. You be firm. You shake everything off and you say, I want to be new. I want a new beginning. If there's nobody that has wants to do that, then if you have given your life to Christ but you know that you are just religious, you are not in Christ. I want you to bow your head and talk to God and ask him to help you rededicate your life to him say that you want to start afresh I'm not talking religion I'm talking about being a good person that believes God, that trusts God that has confidence in him and I know that the God that we serve will draw you back to himself he will bless you he will be with you, he will keep you Father we thank you for your word today our story will not be in vain our story will be a foundation that when we build on that foundation, the name of the Lord will be glorified. Father, as we move forward, even later and in this year, we pray that you will come upon us with your blessings. Your blessings will overtake us. We will finish strong. We will finish well. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.